Good evening and welcome. I'm Catherine Kangany, JHSM's Executive Director, and we are so pleased that you all are joining us this evening for tonight's program in celebration of Black History Month. Quick point of housekeeping before we begin. After tonight's lecture, we'll open up the floor for Q&A. If you wish, wish to submit a question at any point, please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to do so, and I will moderate those questions um, after the lecture concludes. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Mary Elizabeth Murphy is an associate professor and chair of history at Eastern Michigan University. She's a historian of the United States with specialties in US women's history, African-American history, and US social and political history. In 2018, she published Jim Crow Capital, Women and Black Freedom Struggles in Washington, DC, 1920 to 1945 with the University of North Carolina Press. She's also written for Washington History, the Journal of Urban History, and the Washington Post. And she's currently working on a book about African-American women and bus segregation before the Montgomery bus boycott. And tonight she speaks to us about riding in solidarity, Jewish Americans, African-Americans, and the fight against interstate bus segregation. Please welcome uh, Mary Elizabeth Murphy. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so as Katie said, the title of my talk is Riding in Solidarity, Jewish Americans, African Americans, and the Fight Against Bus Segregation. Before I begin, I want to thank Kara Schumann for coordinating my visit and Catherine Kangany for inviting me. I am truly honored to speak at the Michigan Jewish Historical Society this evening. So in my talk this evening, I'm going to touch a bit on the work that I've been doing in the past couple of years. And this was made possible through a fellowship through Jewish studies at Eastern Michigan University. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the origins of the Black Jewish Alliance in the United States. I'm gonna look at three moments of this alliance, and then I'm going to offer some conclusions. So, in 2019, I received a fellowship from Kirk and Sharon Prophet in coordination with Jewish studies at Eastern Michigan University. And this fellowship coincided with my sabbatical, where I spent January, February, and parts of March before lockdown researching this topic at the Library of Congress, the Western Reserve Historical Society, and the National Archives. On January 5th, 2021, the twin victories of Georgia candidates John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock to the U.S. Senate sparked many conversations about the historic alliance between Jewish Americans and African Americans. This partnership had a history. In the post-war Black freedom struggle in the United States, Jewish Americans were some of the most visible white allies, whether it was the brutal murders of Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, the iconic alliance of Martin Luther King with his hands clasped next to Rabbi Heschel at the Selma March, or the formidable legal team of Jack Greenberg, Thurgood Marshall, and Constance Baker Motley, who argued Brown v. Board of Education. Indeed, throughout the 20th century, Jewish Americans have been outspoken about a range of Black civil rights matters, including economic inequality, racial segregation, and violence. And Jewish Americans were also active in the fight against bus segregation. In 1961, a group of 436 black and white freedom riders boarded buses that began in Washington, DC and snaked down into the deep South, testing the enforcement of Supreme Court cases that outlawed interstate bus segregation. Jewish Americans composed two thirds of the white riders, including Israel Dreshner, who earned the worthy title as the most arrested rabbi in America. Members of the American Jewish Congress wired telegrams to Attorney General Robert Kennedy, protesting this racial violence and pressing for the federal government to intervene. Not only did Jewish organizations express their support for the integration of interstate transportation, but they also championed the end of segregation on citywide buses. In 1956, Sidney Hollander, the committee chair of the American Jewish Congress, invited Martin Luther King Jr. to deliver the opening plenary at the organization's biennial convention in Miami Beach, Florida, 
Here, Martin Luther King recounted his two-year involvement with the Montgomery bus boycott, where mostly working class black women marched with their feet in defiance of the humiliation of Montgomery buses. For Sidney Hollander, hearing King's narrative of the bus boycott must have resonated deeply. Hollander's Maryland-based pharmaceutical company employed several black women as office cleaners. In the early 1940s, when one of these employees attempted to buy a Greyhound bus ticket for a family visit to Virginia, agents refused to serve her. After several unsuccessful attempts, Hollander intervened, purchased the bus ticket himself, and handed it to his employee. But then the agents refused to check her bag, which meant that she had to carry heavy luggage during transfers. Sidney Hollander was so disturbed by these, quote, discriminatory attitudes that he wrote to the Interstate Commerce Commission and recommended that they conduct an investigation into the Greyhound Bus Corporation. His letter also reached the desk of National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Chief Legal Counsel Thurgood Marshall, who agreed with Hollander, noting that Greyhound was a, quote, longtime offender. Sidney Hollander's actions against bus segregation fit into a longer history of Jewish Americans, mostly immigrants who served as critical allies in this struggle from the 1920s until the 1940s. Jewish Americans activism and solidarity in this interwar era laid the foundation for this iconic alliance that flourished in the post-war period and still resonates today. The roots of this black Jewish relationship can be traced to the early 20th century. Waves of anti-Semitism in Europe prompted two million Jewish citizens to immigrate from Eastern Europe to the United States, settling in large urban centers along the East Coast and the Midwest. These cities were also home to thousands of recently migrated black Southerners who also fled their homeland. Even though Jewish immigrants and black migrants often labored in separate jobs, they encountered each other as distant neighbors or as customers and proprietors. When Jewish immigrants arrived in the United States, they often settled in neighborhoods on the borders of black neighborhoods. Jewish immigrants also operated small businesses in black neighborhoods, selling groceries, furniture, clothing, and even hiring some black employees. These business relationships knit even tighter bonds of familiarity between these communities. Even if they did not meet each other in these contexts, Jewish Americans and African Americans often boarded the same streetcars and buses. By the early 1920s, the commercial bus industry appeared in the United States. Buses were cheaper than trains, could transport passengers to more locations, and were branded as an inexpensive form of transportation. By 1925, there were over 6,500 bus companies that transported passengers throughout the United States as well as Canada and Mexico. But when the stock market crashed in 1929, Greyhound absorbed many of these smaller lines and became the preeminent bus line in the United States. By the mid 1930s, more Americans were riding buses than trains. On most Greyhound buses, black passengers were subject to a color line, whether it was racial segregation, exclusion, or racial violence. On the one hand, this is unsurprising. In the United States in the 1920s and 1930s, nearly every aspect of American life is segregated, typified in separate drinking fountains, schools, and department stores. But buses were different because buses were violent and conflicts over racial segregation on a bus could result in physical violence and on some occasions, murder. White bus drivers enforced the color line through verbal assaults, physical abuse, and by the late 1930s, bullets and pistols. Most white Americans were largely silent about the discriminatory attitudes and racial violence of white bus drivers and bus corporations with one major exception, Jewish Americans, many of whom were recent immigrants to the United States. As Jewish immigrants were grappling with their identity and becoming Jewish Americans, many wove black solidarity into their articulation of rights in the United States, performing what I term empathetic citizenship. As new immigrants learning the intricacies of United States citizenship, Jewish Americans pledged allegiance to their new homeland by offering mournful solidarity in the struggle for Black equality. Through their words and actions, Jewish Americans highlighted the fragility of American democracy that was predicated on a racial hierarchy. 
first generation Jewish Americans were sensitive to bus segregation, precisely because it mirrored the anti Semitism that they had experienced in many European countries. For Jewish Americans, these systems of discrimination provoked both a visceral reaction and a call to action. Jewish Americans were more likely to sit near black passengers and they risked their physical safety to intervene in bus segregation. There was a strong likelihood that black and Jewish passengers would encounter each other on this bus. Jewish immigrants were the first working class community in the United States to embrace vacations. And they often rode buses to visit um, Atlantic City or the Catskills, while black migrants traveled by bus to sustain their familial connections in the South. Even though they were coded as white, Jewish passengers crossed racial boundaries to side with black riders. Not only did Jewish Americans risk their safety, but they also spoke out at a moment of both heightened anti-Semitism and stringent opposition to Jewish immigration. These loud protests from Jewish Americans reverberated alongside the silence from other white Americans for whom Jim Crow was an established institution. Sidney Hollander serves as a crucial link between this earlier period of activism and the post-war Black freedom struggle. Beginning in the 1920s, Jewish Americans emerged as the strongest white allies in the fight for bus integration, whether they were ordinary bus passengers, lawyers, or members of civil rights organizations. Through their steadfast work and allyship, Jewish Americans joined African Americans in making Black civil rights an issue about the fate of American democracy. And this movement began on the bus. In July 1927, Samuel S. Siegel, a Jewish immigrant from Romania, was enjoying a relaxing vacation in South Haven, Michigan. This resort town, popularly known as the Catskills of the Midwest, attracted many Jewish families in the summer months. While he was waiting at a Greyhound bus terminal to take him back to his home in Chicago, Siegel, a tailor who labored in a fur shop, witnessed a well-dressed black man clutching a ticket for his destination of Benton Harbor, Michigan. When this man showed his ticket to the white driver, he shoved him aside and allowed two white passengers to board the bus. Horrified, Samuel Siegel approached the man and expressed his disgust at this behavior that he had just witnessed. He told the man that he would stay with him to make sure that he could board his bus. A few hours later, when Siegel and the black man boarded the next bus, a passenger alerted the driver that there was a black man on the bus. He swiftly marched over to him, called him a dirty drunkard, and threatened to use physical violence. Siegel intervened, questioning why the driver was harassing this passenger. It was Siegel's actions that caused the driver to defuse the situation. When Siegel returned to his home in Chicago, he penned a letter to the city's black newspaper, the Chicago Defender. Narrating this incident in vivid detail, Siegel described the violent behavior of the bus driver. Rather than connecting this discrimination with the wanton behaviors of a single person, Siegel argued that the bus driver's behavior was sanctioned by the Greyhound Bus Corporation. In offering this assessment, Siegel correctly diagnosed racism in the United States as both interpersonal and systemic. He also inserted himself into the narrative, declaring, quote, as a member of the Jewish race, which has also and is still subjected to uncivilized persecution, I deeply and sincerely resent such incidents. By acknowledging past and present patterns of anti-Semitism, Siegel rhetorically linked the fate of Jewish Americans and African Americans. And so there's a couple of interesting things about Siegel's statement. He calls himself a member of the Jewish race, perhaps to link himself um, to African Americans who are also a racial other. Through his words and actions, he also let black subscribers of the Chicago Defender know that he was a Jewish passenger who disapproved of these policies. For African Americans, reading Siegel's letter might have offered them a bit of comfort when there were some white Amer and let them know that there were some white Americans who were their allies on the bus. A few years later, Maurice Roosboom, a Jewish immigrant from Amsterdam, was traveling on a, a Greyhound bus in Westchester County, New York. Roosboom, who worked as a salesman at a rubber company, had immigrated to New York in 1910, but was currently in the process of becoming a naturalized citizen. 
When he boarded the bus in Connecticut, he immediately noticed the bus driver who spent the majority of his time kind of flirting and engaging with white women passengers and ignoring a lot of the passengers in the back of the bus. When the bus stopped in Stamford, Connecticut, a 20 year old black woman named Eleanor Tool boarded the bus and the driver ordered her to move to the back where there was not a single empty seat. Tool labored as a live-in servant for a wealthy family, which was an exhausting job. Rather than being able to rest and relax on her trip, she had to stand on a dark and shaky bus. Roosboom intervened and suggested that Tool take a seat near the front. When the driver threatened to eject Roosboom from the bus, he bravely told him that he was treating bus passengers like cattle with his bulldozing techniques. After exchanging sharp words, Roosboom assured the bus driver that he would be contacting the bus, the Greyhound Bus Corporation. The very next day, Maurice Roosboom sent a pointed letter to Greyhound, where he highlighted the disrespectfulness that the driver showed toward the black passenger. Importantly, Roosboom referred to Tool as Miss Eleanor Tool, giving her a polite um, title that was rarely accorded to black women. He also reached out to the NAACP asking them to pressure the bus company to ensure that Tool would receive an apology for her mistreatment on the bus. He ended his letter to the NAACP with, by saying, quote, yours for the elimination of all prejudices, thereby linking the common oppression of Jewish Americans and African Americans. While Maurice Roosboom and Samuel Siegel bore witness to individual cases of bus discrimination, others protested the system of segregation entirely. In September 1944, Eleanor Gutman was traveling around the country, collecting signatures to put Norman Thomas, a socialist candidate, on the ballot for president. When she stopped at a Greyhound restaurant, she rejected the cafe's segregated seating arrangement and opted to sit in the section called Colored. Gutman was the daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants who had recently emigrated to the United States in the 1910s. White police officers immediately arrested Gutman for attempting to create a race incident. Newspaper articles detailing her arrest raced through the black press, letting readers know that a white woman, the daughter of Jewish immigrants, opted for black protest over white privilege. And Sidney Hollander, aforementioned, discovered, that these, pra discovered these practices not as a passenger, but rather as an employer. Unlike the Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, Sidney Hollander was not a recent immigrant. Rather, he was a prominent German businessman whose family traced their ancestry to the United States for generations. But cumulatively, the disconnected figures of Samuel Siegel, Maurice Roosboom, Sidney Hollander, and Eleanor Gutman all connected to serve as critical allies in the fight against bus segregation. By directly confronting the systems of discrimination, Jewish Americans articulated a vision of empathetic citizenship predicated on racial equality. These actions re reached a broad swath of African Americans, whether they were reading an article in the Black press, working at the NAACP, or riding in a segregated bus. In a moment when most white Americans either supported racial segregation or ex expressed apathy to these practices, the words and actions of Jewish Americans were conspicuous. By the late 1930s, the Greyhound Bus Company began to train their drivers to act like police officers. And so this is an image from the Greyhound Bus Company's in-bus magazine. It's called The Highway Traveler. And you can see that it depicts a bus driver encountering two white boys on a sandy beach in Florida. Since the opening of Dixie Highway in 1915, Greyhound was always promoting travel in Florida. And so you can see that this is meant to be a very gentle and welcoming image. Um, you can see that this bus driver is perhaps protecting these young boys from getting too close to the water, and it's signaling that he's a safe person. But if you look closely, you'll notice that the bus driver has a gun in his holster, which is part of his uniform. And so Greyhound has begun to style its bus driver uniforms on the police. Um, so here's a bus driver uniform on the left and police officer uniforms in New York City on the right. And you can see that both uniforms involve boots, caps, badges, and especially guns. 
It's unclear why Greyhound chose to model their bus drivers on police officers, but by the late 1930s, every Southern state has deputized bus drivers as officers of the peace, enabling them to carry guns and make citizens arrests. And also you can see the difference in perception of police officers. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you see a Greyhound bus driver in Highway Traveler. And then on the right, you see an image that I showed at the beginning of this talk. This is a bus driver on um, a bus. And you can see that he is holding his gun over a black passenger as a black woman is trying to protect her child in fear. Um, and so you can see that bus drivers are received very, very differently in black and white communities. And Jewish Americans were aware of this tension and paradox and sought to intervene. During World War II, racial tensions exploded on all forms of transportation, but were especially pronounced on buses. Only a few days after the United States entered World War II, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8889, which created the Office of Defense Transportation, the ODT, to coordinate its vast transportation programs. The ODT signed contracts with the Greyhound Bus Corporation and other similar lines to transport civilians, soldiers, and even Japanese internment camp evacuees to destinations across the country. The fact that the ODT partnered with Greyhound now made the federal government a complicit actor in racial bus violence. During World War II, the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund handled many different bus segregation cases. Thurgood Marshall chaired the office and he was assisted by the Jewish attorney Milton Convitz. A native of Safed in what was then Palestine and is now Israel, Convitz's family moved to New York City in the early 20th century. During his tenure with the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, Milton Convitz assisted 12 African Americans who experienced bus segregation. In some cases, there was very little that convicts could do. While humiliating, it was legal for states like Georgia or Mississippi to require Black passengers to sit in the back of the bus. But most Black passengers alerted the NAACP when they were segregated on interstate buses or buses that were traveling across state lines, um, highlighting which raised the question of the legality of interstate transportation segregation. Milton Convitz handled several cases of Black women who were abused at the hands of white bus drivers, stranded in unfamiliar locations, or subject to racial violence. It was a deeply radical act for Milton Convitz, a Jewish immigrant from Palestine, to handle these cases and serve as an intermediary between Black women and white bus drivers, who acted at every moment to undermine their dignity. But when Black soldiers wearing army uniforms appealed to the NAACP about similar types of bus conflicts, Milton Convitz was able to exert more leverage in the fight for integrated transportation. In March 1943, Corporal Reuben Pleasant, a native of Fort George, Maryland, was traveling back to his base, which was called Maxwell Field in Alabama. On a city bus in Montgomery, Reuben Pleasant took a seat in, front, in the front in defiance of strict segregation policies. The white bus driver, Louis, Loomis Farmer, grabbed his pistol and shot Reuben Pleasant in the leg. As soon as the NAACP learned about the case, Milton Convents and other lawyers pressed both the War Department and the Department of Justice to intervene. Loomis Farmer was not the only white bus driver to assault black men and women in the military. At this point, the NAACP had already handled several types of cases, but had struggled to convince the War Department and the Department of Justice to take action. But with the Reuben Pleasant case, lawyers felt glimmers of progress when the War Department suggested that they might take, quote, appropriate punitive action to try civilians who mistreated soldiers off the base. This news caused leaders at the NAACP to feel optimistic, arguing that this marked, quote, the beginning of a new policy to prosecute the white men who wantonly attacked black soldiers. In a follow-up letter to the War Department, Milton Convitz expressed optimism that this proposed policy might set a, quote, precedent for future cases. 
Only one month after the shooting of Reuben Pleasant, the NAACP learned about the assault of Charles O. Lightfoot, a 29-year-old sergeant who was stationed at Camp McCain, a military bus in the deep south city of, N of Granada, Mississippi. In April 1943, Lightfoot boarded a tri-state bus at the terminal in Jackson to return to his base. During the journey, as more and more passengers boarded the bus, the white driver ordered Lightfoot to move to the back. Lightfoot did not hear this order, causing the white driver to march over to him and shout epithets and telling him that he had to listen when a white man speaks. The driver also began to hit him on the head with a pair of ticket punchers. Lightfoot reached into his pocket and grabbed a knife to fend off the driver. A white lieutenant intervened to protect Lightfoot from the violent bus driver. When the bus pulled into Starkville, Mississippi, a mob began to appear outside of the bus. And 25 white soldiers crowded around Charles Lightfoot, presumably to murder him in an act of extra legal violence. The town sheriff and two state troopers swiftly arrived. Eyewitnesses reported that rather than ending the violence, these law enforcement officials continued to beat Lightfoot with clubs and blackjacks for 30 minutes before arresting him and depositing him in the Starkville County Jail. When Lightfoot returned to his military base, he found that he had already faced a preliminary hearing where he was charged with intent to kill and murder. He wrote to the NAACP from a place of sheer desperation. I hope it is in your power, he pleaded, to send me a lawyer. Reassuring the NAACP of his innocence and his desire to be a free man, he stated that he would be more than grateful for their help. Aware of the sheer importance of Charles Lightfoot's case, Milton Convitz took an aggressive approach. He sent the case for review at the NAACP's office in Washington, D.C., and he also con contacted the War Department. Milton Convitz stayed in touch with Charles Lightfoot's sister, letting her know that the Washington office of the NAACP was investigating the case. Milton Convitz's advocacy at the War Department paid off. In June 1943, Truman Gibson from the War Department sent a letter to Milton Convitz, informing him that the office was carefully examining, quote, the whole problem of transportation and that this issue was under scrutiny. This was a breakthrough. Milton Convitz convinced the War Department about the sheer severity of this problem. One year later, the War Department issued Memorandum Number 92, which stated that buses traveling on military bases should not subject their Black soldiers to racial segregation, which ever gradually paved the way for the very slow desegregation of transportation. But the order came too little too late. During World War II, white bus drivers shot and killed at least six black soldiers over conflicts about bus segregation, and no driver was ever punished for his actions. As a Jewish immigrant, Milton Convitz was a powerful ally for African Americans and embodied the very best in interracial cooperation. In an era when most white Americans did not flinch in their attitudes toward racial segregation or interracial violence, Milton Convitz demonstrated an ethic of care in his advocacy work for the NAACP and his devotion to the enforcement of the Constitution. In 1944, he departed the NAACP and joined the New School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University, where he was also offered an appointment at the law school. One year later, after joining the faculty, he published the landmark textbook, um, the Constitution and Civil Rights, which outlined a path for the Supreme Court to dismantle racial segregation across a variety of American institutions. At the same time that Milton Convitz fought for Black civil rights, he also highlighted discrimination against Asian Americans, publishing another landmark textbook, The Alien and the Asiatic in American Law, where he offered sharp critiques of Japanese internment programs in World War II. He also taught thousands of students in his popular classes at Cornell University, including future Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs>
In the aftermath of World War II, leaders at the NAACP continued to highlight the violence of bus segregation. In June 1946, Isaac Woodard, a 26-year-old soldier from New York, was discharged from Camp Gordon in Georgia and boarded a Greyhound bus headed for South Carolina to see his wife. On the bus, Woodard had protested the segregated seating arrangement with the white bus driver, who evicted him from the vehicle. The driver immediately handed Woodard over to a white police officer, Leonard Schull, who beat him mercilessly and gouged out both of his eyeballs. Once newspapers began to report about this assault, leaders at the NAACP made Isaac Woodard the public face of Jim Crow violence. Gloucester Current, the field secretary for the NAACP, outlined the organization's public relations strategy. Gloucester Current recommended that the NAACP mobilize veterans, labor unions, civic groups, and social organizations. Tellingly, Gloucester Current listed only one religious community to contact, Jewish groups. At this moment, Jewish Americans composed only 3.7% of the population of the United States, one of the smallest religious communities in the nation, yet the group that the NAACP identified as their key ally in the fight to secure justice for Isaac Woodard. Jewish, American, Jewish Americans and organizations clamored to speak out and publicize the Woodard case. As a community, Jewish people were reeling from the aftershocks of the brutal Holocaust, where millions of people had perished at the hands of a totalitarian regime in the Nazi party. This devastation unequivocally demonstrated the dangerous consequences of anti-Semitism. Scholars have argued that the Holocaust only strengthened the Black Jewish Alliance in the United States, and this is discernible in the Jewish reaction to Isaac Woodard's assault. In the aftermath of Gloucester Current's call for Jewish solidarity, letters of support poured into the NAACP offices. Dozens of individuals and organizations chimed in, publicly mourning this American tragedy, including the American Jewish Congress, the American Jewish Committee, the Anti-Defamation League, and the International Lady Gar Ladies Garment Workers Union, which was largely composed of Jewish women. Mr. B. Harper, who was a representative of the American Jewish Council of New York, wrote that his organization was dedicated to working with the NAACP and that they would alert, quote, all members and friends. Not only did Jewish Americans denounce the brutality through their organizations, but individual citizens also offered personal lamentations. In particular, leftist Jewish women were outspoken about the Woodard case and sent messages to the NAACP and the federal government, tinged with implicit and explicit references to the Holocaust and the dangers of white supremacy in the United States. In June 1946, Eva Robin, a, Jew, a Russian Jewish immigrant and prominent member of leftist organizations wrote a scathing letter to the Department of Justice. Robin told the attorney general that she, quote, burned with indignation about Woodard's assault. She remarked, quote, Hitler is dead, but his spirit is carried on with Southern white supremacy, which she labeled an act of terrorism. She ended the letter by noting that she was a loyal citizen of the United States and that two of her children had personally served as doctors and nurses in the war. Two months later, Ethel S. Epstein, an attorney who worked, for labor worked as the labor secretary for Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia, donated $250 to Woodard's legal defense, which was a very significant contribution for the 1940s. Epstein argued that the, quote, blame for Woodard's brutality must be shared by the whole nation. In this statement, Epstein argued that racism and prejudice were not simply isolated acts, but rather a burden that the entire country needed to overcome. And at a rally of 31,000 people for Isaac Woodard's defense at Lewis Home Stadium, the Jewish actress Hilda Strauss Vaughn stated that the crowd size was a reflection of this unbelievable tragedy. We hope, Vaughn reflected, that Isaac Woodard's loss of vision may give us a little extra vision. Despite so many pleas for justice, Isaac Woodard never received any. 
An all white jury in South Carolina deliberated for 30 minutes before acquitting officer Leonard Shull of all charges, except his admission that he had attacked Woodard. This acquittal, however, led President Harry Truman to establish a civil rights commission and appoint an interracial group of 15 men and women to serve, including Rabbi Roland L. Gittleshawn, who you see here on the screen. In the 1960s, when Jewish freedom riders were jailed for their protests, Rabbi Gittleshawn implored his fellow Southern rabbis to visit with the activists thereby offering a crucial link between Woodard's assault and similar types of violence on freedom riders. Between 1926 and 1946, Jewish Americans rode in solidarity with black passengers. Risking their lives and potentially their livelihoods, Jewish immigrants bore witness to discrimination and protested racial segregation at a time when there was not a nationally coordinated black freedom struggle. Articulating a discourse of empathetic citizenship, Jewish men and women wove solidarity with the black freedom movement into their Americanization process. Together, Jewish immigrants and black Southern migrants laid the foundation for the freedom rides as they modeled an example of interracial cooperation for fellow riders to witness. Even though Jewish Americans embodied a complexity of identities and ethnicities, Dutch, German, Romanian, Russian, and Sephetic, they all united around a common solidarity with African-American passengers. The moral issue of bus segregation galvanized Jewish Americans from all walks of life stretching from elite businessmen like Sidney Hollander, who you see here on the screen, to lawyer Milton Convitz, to recent immigrants like Samuel Siegel and Maurice Roosboom, and especially to outspoken leftist women like Eva Robin and Ethel Epstein. Over a period of 20 years, these men and women rejected the comforts of a white section and moved to the back of the bus. Thank you. Mary Elizabeth, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that talk. Uh, if you've got questions, um, please please uh, use the chat feature in at the bottom of your screen to put those questions in and I will read them out. Um, while they're coming in, Mary Elizabeth, I have a question for you. And that is, um, were Jewish Americans either persecuted or prosecuted for intervening in these uh, in these cases that you've just outlined? That's a great question. I don't have any evidence that they were um, prosecuted or I think they were persecuted in the sense that white bus drivers, um, that they were put in very dangerous situations and that I think white bus drivers might've gotten violent with them as well. Um, I don't have any evidence that they were directly arrested aside from the example of Eleanor Gottman, um, but I'm sure it existed. It's just that I can't point to precise evidence for this project. Thank you. So first questions come in. Uh, what made you interested in this area? Yeah, so um, I've been researching this for a really long time. I, um, I, I guess I'll take two parts of this. Um, my specialty is African American history. And I've long been interested in kind of Destabilize, destabilizing the idea that Rosa Parks is the first black woman to protest bus segregation. So I'm really interested in an earlier black freedom struggle. And as I was conducting this research over the years, I was really struck by the names that would come into the NAACP office. And so when I would see a letter from someone like Maurice Roosboom or Eva Robin, that really sparked my curiosity. And when I looked them up in the census, not only did I discover that they were Jewish, but I discovered that they were very recent immigrants to the United States. And so that was an incredibly new narrative for me because I began to think about how difficult it is to be a new immigrant in the United States and the kind of persecution that immigrants, especially Jewish immigrants might be experiencing and the bravery and courage that it took for them to ally with African-Americans on the bus. It also strikes me, I, I was thinking about Mark Dollinger's book, um, uh, Black Power Jewish Politics, yeah. uh, and, and, how, and how you're really changing the narrative that he sets forth in that book, where, where he says that, that really it's not until Jews um, uh, acquired or achieved whiteness that then this 
this alliance with the black community developed, and you're showing that actually, as for, for some of these examples, as new immigrants, this alliance was developing. So challenging absolutely. chronology there, I think. Oh, absolutely. I'm definitely pressing him back a little bit. Uh, another question, when did Jim Crow end in the North? Um, that's a great and complicated question. So um, I think on some level, some formal structures did end in the 60s and 70s, but Jim Crow is a really kind of, um, it's a difficult concept because a lot of quote unquote Jim Crow or segregation in the North is about residential segregation. And I think a lot of people would argue that residential segregation still exists in a lot of Northern places. Um, and so a lot of the Northern black freedom struggle focused on doing things like integrating institutions. So looking at the structures of the kind of segregated school system or neighborhoods or just even issues of poverty in the labor market. And that's a lot more difficult to dismantle than say a drinking fountain in the South. So in some ways, Jim Crow in the North is a little bit more um, of a pervasive and kind of difficult institution to dismantle. Um, and some would argue that it's still not over. So a question came in um, about um, Jews and Blacks shared legacy as having experienced slavery. And it's a, it's a um, question that historians grapple with all the time. To what degree did Jews experience um, as, as slaves then, uh, then you know, play into their relationship with the Black community and, and allying with the Black community? So do you, have a, do you have a sense of where you fall in that debate? Yeah, that's a great question. None of my sources really talk about the shared experience of slavery, but they a lot of everyone that I highlighted does kind of mention that they are a separate race. Um, and so rather than calling themselves Americans, they're saying I'm a member of the Jewish race. And so I think in that way, they're trying to signal their kind of shared otherness with African Americans. Um, but I didn't see any precise examples where Jewish um, immigrants would reference um, legacies of slavery. Interesting. Um, someone also asked, I think Truman desegregated the military after Woodard. Is that true? It is true. Yes. So he desegregates the military in 1948. And a lot of historians argue that Woodard's assault is just this galvanizing moment in the nation. Um, and what's a little ironic about it is that at least six black soldiers died during the war. Um, and so it took the, the visibility of Woodard's brutality and assault to kind of wake the nation up. Um, but definitely Harry Truman felt very, very strongly about the Woodard narrative. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a very complicated story because on the one hand, Isaac Woodard is responsible for jumpstarting so much civil rights legislation but he himself paid a really tough price for it. And so his life was pretty much over after this assault occurred. And so he struggled with issues in his life um, and uh, was never really able to receive the justice that he deserved. So you mentioned before the, the talk started um, that you found 200 women that, you're, that you are following and profiling in, in your research. Can you talk a bit about, about what your findings are? I mean, that, that is a tremendous sample size and I can imagine has, has been painstaking, combing through all kinds of records to find them. Can you talk about uh, what you found so far? What kind of conclusions you're able to draw? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a kind of similar narrative um, from, uh, from what I'm talking about with Jewish immigrants, which is that the African American women who are protesting bus segregation are Southern migrants themselves. And so these are Black women that are born in the South and then migrate to Northern and Midwestern cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh um, and Chicago, and especially a lot of cities in Cleveland, I mean, in Ohio. And um, what's interesting is that these Black women, when they encounter bus segregation on buses traveling across state lines, they immediately know that this is illegal because these black migrant women know that Midwestern states have civil rights laws. And so they will contact the NAACP or lawyers and say, no, I live in Illinois. I live in Michigan. This is illegal. And so I was really fascinated to see the kind of political consciousness 
that working class black women who are waitresses and domestic servants have. Um, and I think the other surprising thing is that a lot of black women are doing this kind of in spite of the NAACP. Um, and so they're the ones that are going out and hiring lawyers and suing. And sometimes they'll win victories and the NAACP will have to contact them and say, can we have the text of your case? We didn't know that you had uh, launched or waged this. So that's one of the first interesting things, which is that I think Black women are kind of ahead and they're the ones that are pushing the NAACP and they're showing them the power of the law. Um, the second thing is that for a brief period of time in the Midwest, white judges side with black women. So a lot of white judges in Chicago and Indiana and Illinois and Ohio all point to these civil rights laws. Um, and I think that's because bus travel is so new. No one knows where it's going. And so in the late 1920s, early 1930s, it's just such a fluid time that it's easier to rule against a bus corporation. But the, the final thing um, that the project, I think, is kind of pointing to is that, ironically, um, it's, it's Black women that are suing these bus companies that are actually receiving justice. Um, so when it's a private company issue, they're able to receive something. But when the government gets involved, the government is never responsible for any of these issues of racial justice. And so ironically, um, Black women have these kind of magnificent lawsuits um, in the period before World War II, and they're able to see justice. And then Black soldiers see this frustrating um, kind of landscape. So it's kind of shifting gender dynamics. And it's, it's also just showing the sheer litigiousness of African-Americans in this period. Wow, it sounds like a fantastic project. We're looking forward to, to watching it develop and then eventually be out in print. Um, please join me in thanking Mary Elizabeth Murphy for a fabulous talk tonight. We appreciate it so much. Thank Take you care. so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.